Hello everybody and welcome to part two of setting up your Fujifilm camera video series. Uh, part one I covered the IQ image quality menus and the autofocus manual focus uh, settings and in this video we're going to talk about the shooting menu, the flash menu, the movie menu, uh, the setup menu, uh, the network USB and the my menu so a whole bunch of things in here uh we'll go through them kind of quickly just as before if you missed uh the previous video uh, i'll leave a link to that down below i will also leave chapter markers down below so you can jump to the point that's most interesting or helpful to you uh, and if you have any questions about things or need further explanation uh, please leave a comment down below or send me an email uh, leave a contact form link down below as well so Let's get started setting up your Fujifilm camera. Uh, go ahead and grab your camera, grab a, a beverage maybe, get comfy. Here we go. So the shooting setting menu has a whole bunch of options. We've got three pages of options. Uh, and you'll notice the first option is grayed out. And that's the toy filter setting. So unless you set your camera to be in that mode or have that active, this will be grayed out. Uh, I never use it, so I don't even really know what the options are, so I'm not going to talk about it. Next uh, the option we have is the Sports Finder mode. That is a cropped in, so what happens is instead of your full picture size, uh, in my case 26 megapixels, it crops in about 10 to 15 percent, I think it's 15 percent, so it's, it's less number of dots which means it's processing less data, which means it can, the camera can do everything more quickly, uh, saving data, uh, creating videos, things like that. So especially around saving photos, it's a lot faster because there's less data to save to the memory card. So the reason you might use this is, as the name implies, in sports or anything that's moving quickly where you're taking a long sequence of photos and you need to write as quickly as possible those photos to the memory card so you can get even more photos. So uh, I have not used the sports finder mode. Uh, I find I don't really need it in most of my use cases. The X-H2S is extremely fast. The S stands for speed, at least that's what I say. So um, I haven't used it. Uh, again, try it if you're not sure, see how it works for you and decide whether you wanna use it or not and when it works best for you. Uh, Pre-shot ESH, what does that mean? The pre-shot means it's gonna, the camera will be creating photos before you even push the button. The ES stands for electronic shutter. Uh, we'll get to that a little bit later uh, in this setup set. So what this means is that unless your camera is in electronic shutter mode, this will not apply. But you have the option to turn it off or on here if you are in electronic shutter mode. Again, what does this mean? So uh, if you're in a situation where things are changing very, very quickly, um, this pre-shot means it's going to be making photos before you even push the button. So it'll save a little bit before you push the button. So you don't have to be as stressed maybe about the right moment because it's as soon as you're pointing your camera at something, it's going to be making a few photos beforehand. Uh, each camera will be a little different in, in how many photos it makes beforehand. But uh, again, try this to see how it works in your specific situation. Uh, again, here you can see there's a note at the bottom that works only with ES, electronic shutter, and CH, continuous high burst shooting only. So uh, this is only for specific situations, but it is there for you if you need it. Uh, next up, we have the self timer. And what this is, is just like it says, you're probably familiar with this one. You can choose between two and 10 seconds for how long after you push the shutter button before the camera makes the photo. So obviously you can use that to run around and get in your own photo. Or uh, one place I use this quite often is when my camera's on a tripod and I'm photographing uh, a scene uh, using a longer exposure, uh, I don't want any camera shake to be in the photo. And it's amazing how much movement you get from just pushing the shutter button to make your photo just not quite as sharp as you might like. So by setting a two second self timer, the camera on a tripod, uh, push the button, one, two, the camera counts down, makes the photo without me touching it, 
and it's stopped vibrating in those two seconds. So that's how I use self timer quite frequently. Next up is the save self timer setting. What that means is if you've turned on the self timer, even if you turn off the camera, the next time you turn the camera on, your self timer's still on. And that can be a little frustrating for me at least uh, by turning on the camera and you push the button and you're like, wait, why isn't it making a photo? And then all of a sudden two to 10 seconds later, it goes click. So uh, if you ever have that happen where your your camera is delayed after you push the button, it means the self timer stayed on. Uh, for me, I turn this setting off because I'll forget if I turn it on and then wonder why I couldn't make a photo when I wanted to. Uh, self timer lamp, you can turn that off or on. What that is, is the little light that is the AF assist light on my camera, it's up here will flash, blink, uh, to let you know that the self timer is active and it'll blink faster as it gets closer to pressing the button for you to make the photo. So uh, you can turn that off or on. Again, personal preference. Interval timer shooting, that is uh, for time-lapse photography. So this is a, a very cool type of photography. It's often fun because you can uh, use these settings to take, in this case, it's gonna create a photo every two seconds. That's what my settings are. And how many photos it will make is on the right. So infinite number of photos. So until I turn the camera off, it runs out of power, or I push the shutter button again to interrupt the process. So time-lapse photos are pretty cool. So those are the photos where you see the flower opening or you see the clouds roaring by really quickly. Uh, it's, it, you, you take a sequence of photos and then you combine them into a movie using ed video editing software to take those photos that were maybe 100 or 200 photos and combine it into a three or maybe 10 seconds now video clip with those photos. So creating a time-lapse photos can be a, a really fun process. There's a fair bit of work in that. It's a whole genre of photography. Uh, lots of YouTube videos about that. Uh, so uh, feel free to explore that and see if that's something you might be interested in investing some time and learning. Next up on page one, the last option on page one of this menu is interval timer shooting exposure smoothing. Uh, just as it sounds, what that's gonna do is adjust your exposure just a little bit if the light changes during the, the duration of your time lapse. You can turn that off or on. Next we have on page two, AE BKT setting. That is auto exposure bracket setting. You might be asking, what is a bracket? Well, you know what a bracket is that holds things together. A bracket is, in this case, a group of photos, a sequence of photos made with one shutter press usually. So what this setting does is you get to choose what happens during that sequence of photos that get made. So let me show you the settings. So first up, how many photos and how much changes between each photo. So that's the frames slash step setting. All right, so here's how this works. Your first step is to pick how many frames you want. This gets a little confusing because there's plus minus sign and then as you can see at the bottom, minus two. Here's how this works. Look at the chart at the bottom of the screen. That's your exposure meter. At zero is your starting point. Whether you're in manual exposure, that's wherever your camera is set to, or if you're in auto exposure, that's where your camera sets the exposure. And then you'll notice, because I'm at plus minus five, there are two dashed lines to the right and to the left of that zero point. The ones to the right are plus. That means it will be brighter than the original photo. I'm gonna get two of those. One that's a little brighter, one and two thirds, that's the step and then one that is three and a third, that's the second step. And you go negative, you'll get one and two thirds negative and three and a third negative. So I have a total of five photos going from a lot darker to quite a bit brighter. So a total of five photos. You could use this to just go darker, that's the minus two, or you could use it to just go brighter, there's plus two at the top of this that I'm not showing. I usually go, uh, choose the plus and minus option because I want the both brighter and darker to give me the most ability to have exposure information in the photo that is the broadest, the biggest. 
So it's up to you. Experiment with this if you want a little bit. Again, uh, YouTube videos talk about this specifically. If you want some more information or again, send me an email, write a comment, and I can uh, uh, help you a little bit more there. And then the sequence is uh, how it's going to save the photos. Uh, it will save them. In my case, I'm going from dark to zero, which is the average slash normal, to bright. You can go the other direction or you can start from zero and go dark to bright. So those are your options. Choose as fits best for you. Another option for bracketing is the next one down, which is film simulation bracketing. Uh, so using the film simulations, in my case, I'm using Classic Chrome as my film simulation. You may have others. Now you have the option to have every time you make a photo, it's going to make three photos with each having a different film simulation applied to it. So, th so this is another way to have almost edited options for your photos in camera. So you maybe you want to make one that's black and white, one that's a very vivid color uh, film simulation and one that's more a muted color film simulation. So you get all different options with one click of the shutter button. So it's kind of cool if you want to have options in camera and don't want to go to your computer for editing choices later. Uh, another bracketing option we have is for focus bracketing. So this is where uh, you either choose how many options you want here or let the camera automatically decide. So what focus bracketing is, I can maybe best describe by looking at what you're seeing on screen right now. So I'm in focus, but the background's auto out of focus. If you did focus bracketing, which often gets used in macro photography because you're very close to your subject and there's a very shallow depth of field when you're generally close to your subject. So if you want like a whole flower in fo focus that you're very close to this setting, focus bracketing, which will Focus close, next little bit, close, farther away, farther away, farther away, farther away, farther away, until it has the whole subject in focus. That's the uh, focus bracketing method. Again, lots of YouTube videos that will talk you through the specifics of doing this, walk you through how to actually use this with your specific camera, and give you some suggestions and tips on how to best implement this. But it's another really cool tool to give you more options for another way of creating photos. Uh, next option here is photometry. Photometry, what's that? That's about exposure. So as the camera is looking at the frame, the scene you're pointing it at, how is it deciding how to create the correct brightness in the photo? And there's basically four options here. The top one is multi, which means it's gonna look all around the frame and kind of decide on its own where the focus should be of both attention and brightness. Uh, center weighted will mean around the middle of the frame will be the place where it places the most emphasis for uh, making brightness decisions in the photo. Spot is uh, usually tied to the focus spot. So wherever you have focused, that will be a smaller area where it determines uh, this is the place that's most important for determining brightness in the photo. And then the last is average, where everything in the, the scene is treated equally, and it does some math to figure out, in, given the whole overall brightness in the scene, what should I make for uh, my brightness decision for the photo? And so that last one in particular, that average one, is if you've ever made a photo of the moon, and it's just a white blob of no detail, it's because it's bright, yes, but everything around it's very dark. So in average, the scene is dark, which means the thing that's bright is going to show up as super bright. So that's why average can be a little problematic when you have very high contrast of brightness, something very bright and something very dark in the same scene. So there you go. All right, next up we have uh, cho choices to make about what kind of shutter we're using in our camera. So this uh, choice options include a whole bunch of things here. So I'm gonna walk through each of these individually. So the mechanical shutter is the traditional type of shutter in a camera. So when I go click with this, it'll make a sound. And that's because inside the camera, 
there is a shutter that opens and closes. It's mechanical. There's a device that opens and closes to make the photo. So back to the chart. So mechanical shutter, that's traditional way that photos have been made. Uh, electronic shutter is what's in your phone. Uh, if you wonder why your phone doesn't make any noise when you make a photo, this is why. Because there's all it's doing is saying, uh, make the photo now, so save everything the camera, the sensor is seeing, save that to the memory right now. Uh, nothing has to move to make that happen. So this, the next setting is called EF, which stands for electronic shutter plus a front curtain shutter. So in, in a camera, there are two pieces to the shutter. So it opens and closes behind it. So there, it drops and then another part falls. So this means that it's just gonna fall and, they, and the other part won't follow behind. So it's kind of a combo of both things. Uh, again, there's videos that will really discuss this in detail. The short version is kind of choose one or the other for most situations. Choose electronic or mechanical for most situations. The chart will also show you what the limits are for each. So when I'm on mechanical shutter, you can see my fastest shutter speed is one eight thousandth of a second. When I'm in electronic shutter, uh, I can go to one thirty-two thousandths of a second because I don't have any moving parts to contend with. EF, it'll tell you why uh, you want to use this. So the blackout time is the time where your screen goes dark as in between photos. Um, and again, it'll tell you some more information uh, about how good situations for this. So this is mechanical plus electronic. Uh, so the mechanical shutter works until eight thousandths of a second, and then electronic shutter kicks in at short shutter speeds faster slash shorter duration than one eight thousandths of a second. And then we get this one. Uh, it's just kind of this weird combo, uh, and you can read what it's doing. Uh, again, um, the choice is depending on the situation. Again, I recommend watching some YouTube videos about this to help you determine if it's a good choice for you. My short version. I'm 99% of the time using mechanical shutter. So here's why. Why wouldn't you just use electronic shutter? That means there's no moving parts, less wear and tear on your camera. While that's true, there's a couple of potential problems that happen with electronic shutter and they're related to how cameras save data. The short version, I hope, is this. As you, so your camera sensor is, is a, a rectangle that, of dots, 24.6 million of them on my camera. Uh, if you have an X-T5 or an X-H2S, you've got 40 million dots. And that means all those dots have to send their data to the com computer to process it in camera to save it to the memory card. And it's basically doing it line by line, okay? And it happens really quickly, but not instantaneously. That means that part of the photo happens a little bit after the other part. So if something's moving, uh, you might see a vertical line that gets bent. So something that's straight, if you're using electronic shutter and driving by it in a car, might look like this because the top part of it wrote at a different time than the bottom part of the pole. So that's one reason for electronic shutter. It's called the jello effect, because if you've ever seen a propeller on an airplane look like it's doing this, uh, that's because on a phone photo or phone video, that's because this, it can't write this, the photo data fast enough that, to cover the movement of the thing that's moving quickly. Sorry, I said this would be short. Not short yet. Anyway, the, the other reason for electronic shutter potential not to use is, again, cameras aren't, they're kind of most getting optimized for electronic shutters, but they're not 100% optimized. So sometimes there's some other image quality issues because of saving all that data at one time or trying to and not quite being able to do so. If you've listened to photo news lately, in late 2023, early 2024, there's some conversation starting about this thing called global shutter, which is where all of the camera data, all those dots are written at exactly the same time. You, and that sounds great, right? And it is. 
from a technical standpoint, but they're still working out some of the issues around that. Um, again, watch some videos about global shutter and there's a camera coming out called the Sony A93, or it is out now, that has global shutter. Go read about it if you want. Anyway, so that's kind of a long way to say I use mechanical shutter. Uh, the nice thing about ES, electronic shutter, is it's completely silent. Uh, you can assign a sound to the mechanical shutter or have it be completely silent. So uh, if you're in a situation that needs total silence making photos, ES, electronic shutter, can be a good solution for that. But most of the time, uh, especially on uh, Fujifilm cameras with in-body image stabilization, the shutter's pretty quiet. So if I move the camera out here, can you even hear it? So I'm making photos. Oops, let's turn this around so you can see I'm making photos. I don't know if you can hear that or not. Anyway, choices, more choices. And uh, sometimes there are implication in those choices for image quality. If you want maximum image quality, uh, mechanical shutter is the way to go. If you want silence, electronics the way to go. If you need really fast shutter speed, electronic is the way to go. I guess that's the short version. All right, back to the slides. Uh, flicker reduction. This is about working with uh, lights that uh, appear to flicker in your photos or where you, it looks like one light is on and one light is off. Uh, lights refresh at different rates, uh, so that's why you might need to adjust for that. And that's similar to the flickerless SS setting down below. Um, so the flickerless S settings is kind of designed primarily for LED lights. Flicker reduction is designed primarily for fluorescent lights. At least that's my understanding as I read things. So. <laughs> Prove me wrong, leave a note in the comments. Last here on page two is the IS image stabilization mode. So my camera has in-body image stabilization. So there, the sensor is on a, a mount that moves to adjust for any small camera movements. So you can turn this to continuous. So it's always on, it's always active. So even if I don't have the shutter button pushed down halfway, the image stabilization is always working. Um, shooting only means as long as it only is active as I have the shutter button pushed halfway. And then the off means image stabilization is completely off. Uh, just like anything you're doing continuously in the camera, the if it's on continuously, you're using more battery power. So. Uh, if your battery life is an issue, you might turn this to shooting only or maybe even off if you're only in photo situations with lots of light and you don't need the benefit of image stabilization, which usually happens in lower light. So there you go. Next up in our shooting settings, we're on page three. The last page of this is ISO, which is the uh, sensor sensitivity to light. This is where you could set that setting in a menu. I generally prefer to do it on the camera. Uh, the last two options here um, probably won't apply to your camera. The, the cooling fan setting applies to the X-H2S, the X-H2, and the X-S20 as of the time of this recording. They have a place to put a fan on the back of the camera to keep the camera cooler. So this is where you can set those settings. And wireless communication applies to um, if you have a, an adapter set up to your camera, which I don't, so again, doesn't apply here. All right, let's move on to the flash settings options. I'm going to mostly skip this, just show it to you. Here are your options for if you have a flash that's built into your camera or attached to your camera. Um, yeah, so I, I'm just going to show you that they're here and, and then move on to the movie one. All right, you see it, you got it, here we go. All right, next, the movie setting. So we have a bunch of options here, uh, but just one page, which is kind of nice. So the movie mode, uh, when you go to movie mode, I have to, unfortunately, I couldn't record this. When you switch to this setting, it kicks out the HDMI output, so it turns that off. So I had to do a photo of the screen here. So this is where you set the resolution of your video. So we have some standard revolutions. FHD stands for full high definition. It's a 1920 by 1080 
number of pixels in your photo in your image. You can have different ratios of width to height. Um, and then you also have 4K or 6K as your options. Oh my goodness, video is complicated. Again, uh, if this is part of your life, I would suggest watching some YouTube videos about this specifically to make sure you're getting everything just the way you would like. Uh, once you have your uh, size, then you choose your uh, frame rate, which is uh, how, how many frames per second it's recording. This is where you could choose depending on uh, the kind of overall feel or the market you're going to be in. Uh, high speed recording. This is kind of counterintuitive because this is about slow motion. So high speed recording turns on the slow motion recording because it's recording extra frames per second. In my case, this setting, 120 frames. But when you play that back at 30 frames per second, that means it's one quarter the original recording speed. So now it's slower. I know, math. Sorry about that. But that's how that works. Uh, depending on your camera, it will depend, uh, determine what options you have here for uh, choosing a high speed. You might not have any options uh, depending on the age of your camera. Uh, but most modern cameras will have some kind of high speed recording option, at least in 1080p, which is full high definition. So the next video setting is also somewhat nerdy. Uh, so what this means is it's going to start at card number one, then go to card number two if there needs extra space. The stuff at the bottom, MOV slash H265, 420 long, GOP, 200 Mbps. What does all that mean? I'll show you. All right. So H265 refers to the codec, which is the, the formula this, that... Uh, the video is saved in and read from by your software when you're editing the video. I know, it's complicated. There's a bunch of different ways to do it. H.265 is one of the newer. It's uh, very efficient on space. Uh, takes a little bit more processing power on both recording and um, in your editing software. So modern stuff is pretty good at it. So there you go. Long GOP. GOP stands for Group of Pictures. Uh, how is it uh, bundling the photos together to determine how to compress them? And then 420, that means how it's saving, uh, how many bits per, the, yeah, it's confusing still to me. Uh, four is the highest value you can have. So if it was 444, it would be the highest quality. Most consumer cameras can't do that. 420 is good for consumer stuff. And then MOV is the final file format. Uh, which is, in this case, a movie file. The 200 megabits per second, MBS, BPS, is uh, the data rate. The higher that number is, the, uh, the larger your files will be, but the more detail you have, especially good if you have lots of moving things. At the bottom here, it's showing how much time I can record. I have four hours, 39 minutes left to go. Uh, what my recording format is, the 10-bit. Again, oh my gosh, this is so, so detailed. Um, this is another place, if video is gonna be part of your use of the camera, I highly, strongly recommend watching some YouTube videos about video settings specifically. Uh, we have IS mode here as well uh, for video. So do you want IBIS, which is in-body image stabilization, if your camera has that, slash OIS, optical image stabilization, which is potentially a part of your lens. Your lens might have that. So you can choose to have this off or on in movie mode. IS mode boost, the next setting, uh, you can turn that off or on. Um, what IS mode boost is, is electronic magic to try and make your video footage a little more stable if you're moving. And the way it does that is by cropping in just a little bit. So that means it can move things around to kind of offset motion. Uh, so that means you lose a little bit of detail. Um, I haven't used it very much, but I remember when I first watched some videos about the X-H2S and the IS mode boost, it, it reduced the quality of the video a fair bit. So most people recommend not using the IS mode boost. Uh, I haven't tried it lately to know if any firmware updates have improved that, but um, it's something I don't really use in my the times I make video because often I'm on a tripod like I am recording here or not moving very much. Try it, see how it works for you. 
the last uh, uh, option down here is audio settings. There's a bunch of options here for uh, what the camera is going to do around audio. So here's your audio settings options. And there's a lot of them. Uh, if you do, MIC stands for mic, DB is volume, uh, so you're adding or subtracting from volume. Um, so there's a lot of stuff here. My suggestion, if video is part of your life and your audio and your video, either with the internal microphones or if you're attaching microphones directly to the camera, uh, watch some videos about that specifically because it gets pretty detailed pretty quickly. And I just don't have time for this video in this video because it's going long enough. All right, next we're on to the next set of menus, which are the setup settings. So here we go on this. So first, in this one, we have the user settings options. And this is where we have format, uh, so you can erase the memory card. This is a good thing to do uh, once in a while to just kind of keep your memory cards clear and uh, shiny digitally, so to speak. Uh, you can set your area, what location you're in, date and time. You can see all these options. So now near the bottom, the My Menu settings, you'll notice on the left, there's a separate My, M-Y, menu. Uh, so this is where you tell the camera what to put in the My Menu setting. So uh, on the second page, uh, we have the age of the battery, and you can reset the camera. So if you've, if you've made some changes to your camera and it's just misbehaving and you can't remember how to get it back to normal, just click Reset and choose that option and um, it'll go back to zero. So it means you need to reset everything back to the way you want it, but if you have to start over, that's how you do it. Sound setup. Uh, this is not for recording sound, but what the sound your camera makes. So uh, you'll see most of my sounds are off. Uh, the AF beep in particular, um, I turn that off, it's just, I think, very annoying. Uh, also with the self timer beep, all these things. So you've got different options here and you can decide what's best for you. Uh, down in the MS slash EF, so that's the sound the electronic shutter is making. Uh, you can choose to have it make no sound at all if you want, or it can make, there's uh, I think a bank of three or four different sounds. At the bottom is playback volume. That's for video. If you recorded a video, how loud is the volume? of that video playback on the little internal speaker of the camera. Page two is <laughs> this. Yeah, if you're exporting your audio to via XLR, how's it going, how's it doing? Yeah, very nerdy. I don't even know if I have this set up for anything because I don't use this at all. Next, we have the screen setup menu. Uh, this goes pretty quickly because um, this is very personal. So the first is the view mode setting. Uh, that is a button on the side of your camera that determines whether you're viewing through the viewfinder or the, uh, the, uh, the screen on the back of the camera, the LCD, and if it switches automatically between the two. So you can also set that here in this setting. The brightness of the EVF, the color of the EVF, so that's the electronic viewfinder, you have some options to change that. You have the LCD brightness, which is the back screen and color adjustments here. Again, uh, personal taste here, very much up to you. Uh, I do make my LCD brighter because I just find that works better for me. I'm outside a lot. Uh, the last option here is image display, um, which is when you, after you make a photo, is it going to show the photo right away on the screen? I personally turn that off and hit play as I need. The also will show the playback in the viewfinder. So that's why I turn it off because I'm on the viewfinder. After I make a photo, I want to go to the next photo, not look at the photo I just made unless I specifically pause to look at that photo. And then I'll hit the playback button. Auto-rotate is for uh, whether your photos are made vertically or horizontally, it'll rotate for that on playback. Next, we have uh, one of the magic parts of uh, using a mirrorless camera is that you get to see the brightness of the photo before you make the photo, and this is where you turn that on. So you can preview exposure slash WB, so that's exposure and white balance. You can see both the color setting of the photo and the exposure setting before you even make the, the photo, both in the viewfinder and on the back LCD screen. Or you can just have it do the white balance 
uh, and then it's always going to be the same brightness in the photo screen, in the screen, I should say, not the photo, uh, which I don't use. I, I like seeing the exposure before I make the photo, the brightness level. Or you can turn this completely off and then it's functioning kind of like a DSLR. Whenever you're looking through the viewfinder or the back screen, it's always the same brightness and color. So the natural live view setting, this one's a little confusing uh, and I actually had to look this up because I, I leave it off. That What this does is if it's turned on, any settings in the camera will not be visible in what you're seeing. So it's just going to show you the natural live view. Um, in my case, I want that off because I want to see anything I've added to the photo in the actual scene I'm looking at. So I turn it off. Again, if you want a little deeper explanation, do a search Fujifilm natural live view. And there's both videos and explanations about this. But my suggestion, leave it off. You get all the advantages of using a mirrorless camera to see what you're photographing before you make the photo. F-Log View Assist. Oh my goodness, we're a little bit of video here again. So F-Log is um, similar to a RAW file in photos, but it's for video. It's a flat video file saving with maximum contrast, but it looks pretty gray when you're looking at it through the window, through the viewfinder or the back screen. So if you want to see what the final product is going to look like more closely, you can turn on a setting to show what an edited version will look like. And I know that kind of contradicts what I just said with the natural live view, but um, you might have to trust me on that one. Uh, again, if you're not doing video, this doesn't apply to you. If you're not using log in your video, this doesn't apply to you. And if you don't know what log is, again, I would suggest uh, heading over to YouTube, watching some videos. Uh, there are many that will explain it in depth, but it's beyond the scope of what we're trying to do overview here. Electronic level, uh, your viewfinder has the option to uh, include a little level line to help you be straight if you want to be or let you know if you're crooked. Uh, the framing guideline is um, the outline of how many, you, to, again, to help you align subjects in your frame, you can have a, a rule of third grid, which is the nine boxes, or you can do a HD grid or a, a 24 boxes across your frame. Again, depending on what you're trying to do, uh, this will help determine um, what this will, uh, what the best choice is for you. Uh, the HD framing is for video. It'll put lines where uh, the video uh, box goes because the video is a different ratio than the standard three to two of photos. I know there's lots of ratios of math going on here in the screen view. So uh, again, personal preference here, you could turn this off or on if you would like. Auto rotate PB, what is that? It's not peanut butter, it's auto rotate playback. And that means uh, if you have this turned on, when your screen on the back of the camera or in the viewfinder, it'll adjust automatically for a vertical or a horizontal photo. So there you go. The focus scale units, much like the depth of field, this is something I don't really use because I do autofocus, uh, but you can change this from metric to English here if you would like. Aperture units for cinema lens. <laughs> I know, more video stuff. Uh, the aperture unit for cinema lenses is uh, video lenses are uh, different in that they have a T number instead of an F number. Again, if you're not doing video and using cinema lenses, this doesn't apply to you. If it does, I suggest watching a video specifically about that. Uh, I'm going to skip dual display settings uh, just as far as details because what that does is you have the option to, to see in your viewfinder two screens to help you uh, focus better. Um, to me, it's a little visually confusing, so it's something I don't use. Uh, try it, see how it works for you. Uh, if it's helpful or not. Uh, especially if you're doing manual focus, it can be helpful, but since I never do, I don't use this. Uh, so skipping down to display custom settings. So what you have here are four pages of options of what shows up in your viewfinder or on your LCD screen. So we have all these different things, and if they're checked, that means it'll be visible on your viewfinder. So as you can see, there's a lot of stuff. Turn on or turn off those kind of things that you think you'll use and not use. 
So you get lots of data here potentially. So it's some things you may want, uh, some things may not apply to you. So if you like less visual clutter in your viewfinder or screen, turn off what you're not using. All right, next up we have two large indicator mode options. We have one for EVF, the viewfinder, and one for the LCD, the back screen. So that means you can make everything a little bigger. So what that does though potentially is that means you can have obviously less stuff displayed and it's a little, in my experience, unpredictable and not clear what'll show up and what doesn't show up uh, when you make this larger. It can be easier to see, especially on the back screen, but um, sometimes it hides stuff that's important. So I've turned mine off even though I have terrible vision. It's good with my glasses, but terrible otherwise. Uh, you can choose what gets displayed with the large display. So here's a couple pages. Of, it'll show you what it will show and what it won't show. You can choose what goes in each area. Um, so you can make your choices depending on what works best for you. Uh, next, we have the image information contrast adjust. So again, uh, how bright basically is the, the stuff in the display. Uh, depending on your personal preference, you might like more contrast or less contrast, so um, adjust as needed for you. And again, you have the options and it'll show you a brief uh, overview of what that's gonna do for uh, the settings here. Lastly, on page three is location info. Do you want that saved? So if your camera is talking to a phone that has GPS data, it can embed that GPS data in your photos. I have it turned on because why not? It's up to you uh, whether you turn this off or on. Uh, it, the camera itself does not have GPS, so it only works if you are connected to a phone that has GPS and they're talking to each other to save that data. Uh, the sub-monitor setting, uh, this applies currently to GFX cameras and the XH cameras. If you have an XT camera, this does not apply to you. It's the, it's the settings for the smaller screen on the top of the camera. And uh, also you have the sub-monitor background color, which you can also change on the camera. The Q menu, uh, you, what background that has for photo and video, again, you can choose different colors here, or different shades, I should say, contrast. Uh, we'll get to the Q menu in part four of this video series, because this one's going long anyway. All right, next, let's go to the button dial settings. Uh, so button dial settings, we have the focus lever setting. Uh, the focus lever is actually what everybody else calls the joystick. So the joystick on the back of the camera on my X-H2S is up here. It's, um, it's the multi-directional uh, way to point around. It's also what's used by the camera by default to move the focus points around. That's why it's called the focus lever. Um, so the cool trick with this is you can, if you ever want to get your focus point quickly back to the middle, is if you just do a push, it'll move that focus point back to the middle. I use that quite often. So, so that's what this setting is about. Uh, the tilt is uh, lets you edit the focus point, or you can change it to a different setting. So again, your mileage may vary, uh, but the focus lever is what everybody else calls the joystick. Uh, so the next up is the quick menu. How many slots do you want for photo and video? The maximum you can have is 16. The other options are 12, 8, and 4. Skipping down to the function setting. Uh, this is very dependent on your camera, so I'll go through this very quickly. That's all the various buttons, knobs, dials, and things that you can change on your camera to have specific functions that work well for you. Uh, when you uh, activate this, it'll show you a schematic of your camera and then it'll label the different buttons that are available to change and what they are currently assigned to. You will just uh, scroll to each button and then uh, rotate uh, the command dial to change what it is choosing for those options. So again, very specific here. My suggestion again would be watch a video about this specific topic to learn much, much more or just get your camera out and experiment for a little bit and see what works best for you, or do both. Uh, power zoom settings only applies to, I think, two Fujifilm lenses that have a power zoom, so I'm gonna skip that. Next is the selector button settings. Uh, so what's the selector button? So the selector button is what most people call 
the D-pad. Let's see if I can get this to focus. The D-pad. So that's this, oops, on my X-H2S. I can't do this backwards. So on my X-H2S, it's this these four directional buttons around the menu button. So again, from the gaming world, that's called a D-pad, uh, but this is called the selector button. Uh, I have mine set to make that focus because on my X-T1, there wasn't a joystick or a focus lever, lever, lever. Uh, so I just had used, got used to using this for choosing my focus points and I still do. Um, so you can change that to uh, have each of those four directional buttons be a different function as well. So I set mine to be focus, not a function button. And that's how you would do that right here. So if you want it to be a function button, so you would have four different buttons in here instead of acting just as focus area, that's how you would select that. The command dial. Those are the dials on the front and rear of your camera. Uh, and what they do, depending on the exposure mode you're in. So if you're in the program mode, you can have it do different things than if you're in the aperture mode and so on and so forth. Again, very specific to your camera, very specific to your needs. So I'll go quickly through that because we're already taking lots and lots of time. Command dial direction, do you want it to increase if you go left or increase if you go right? Kind of obvious, personal preference there. Um, we'll go quickly through the, the rest of what's going on on this page because it's mostly self-explanatory. So if you choose shutter AF, what it'll give you is the option of a half press. So if you do a half press on the shutter button, it will activate autofocus. That's what that's about. So on the other hand, the same thing is true if for shutter AE. So shutter, a half press on shutter will also activate the auto exposure calculations. So I leave both of those things on. Uh, I, the half press is what makes autofocus happen and auto exposure, if I have it turned on for auto exposure, get calculated. Shoot without lens. So if you don't have a lens on your camera, do you want to make photos? I turn that off. Shoot without card. Uh, I leave that on just every once in a while for demo. Uh, I'm used to doing that at the camera store. So uh, I leave that on. The lens zoom focus setting applies only to uh, the power zoom lenses for Fujifilm, which is just a couple. So uh, most folks don't have that. So I won't apply to this. So the AE AF lock mode, what that does is the AE lock button on the back of your camera, it will apply it only when you're holding it down or it acts as a switch. So that means if I just push it, it's on. If I push it again, it's off. Or it means I only have to, it only applies when I'm holding it down. That's the P mode, the press. And the switch is if I just push it once, it's on, push it again, it's off. Same for auto white balance lock, if you have a button assigned to that. I'm gonna skip most of the last settings here because um, some cameras they won't apply to and we're getting long as it is. One last thing on touchscreen settings. Again, you have some options here, very personal. Uh, since I don't use the touchscreen, I, I leave this off. But uh, it's kind of nice to know what this touchscreen's options are, and this is where it's located. Uh, the last option here is lock, which will basically, if you have this set, it locks the Q button from not working. So uh, if you do a long press on the menu button, like about three seconds, that will activate the lock, and then your Q button doesn't work anymore. So just so you know, if you're ever unable to get to your Q menu, this could be why. So you can go here to change it or hold your menu button down for three seconds, then it should unlock. Uh, next up are power management settings. Uh, how quickly do you want the camera to turn off? Uh, you can go from very short to longer times or have it never turn off. Uh, so uh, like for example, the camera I'm recording this on, uh, because I'm recording video continuously, I have it set to never turn off. So I have to manually turn off the camera. Performance boost mode, that means autofocus will be faster everything will be a little quicker in the camera. This is gonna wear down your battery a little more quickly. Uh, EVF slash LCD boost, uh, some cameras have this, some do not. Uh, on the higher uh, end cameras, this is an option to make your viewfinder uh, sharper and uh, faster refresh so everything just looks more smooth. 
Um, the auto power off for temperature, again, this is uh, on more of the recent cameras. Um, because they've got faster processors, sometimes they get warm and they might need to shut down if they get too hot to protect the, the, the electronics. So uh, you can choose the settings for what it does when it gets hot. And this is where you do that. Your save data setups, there's a lot of more setups to go. Hang in there. Uh, go quickly kind of through this. Uh, most of this is, again, specific to you. And, and frankly, I don't ever change it. Um, the card slot setting uh, for separate, that means it's saving. Uh, every time I save a photo, one card gets one photo and the other card gets the other photo. Uh, rather than both of them going to the same card. So it's a little bit of backup data. Um, select folder. Again, that's the name of the folder on your camera that saves you stuff. Copyright info, just really briefly, you can add your name here. It's a tedious process to type this on the camera, but it is doable. And as you can see, it's kind of a funky display because my name is long. So anyway, that's an option down there. Let's move on to network slash USB settings. So this is connecting to other devices. So the first setting is create slash edit connection setting. And that's what you use when you're connecting to a phone with the uh, Fuji app on it, the Fuji X app. Uh, so uh, that's how you will get that started. The connection setting, the next one down is if you're wired to a computer by USB and what it's doing, whether it's doing a data connection or not for that. Obviously airplane mode is um, there. And then we've got Bluetooth, Instax printer, Frame IO is uh, camera to cloud. That's a partnership with a company Adobe owns for uh, sending photo data wirelessly via Wi-Fi directly to a web server. It's kind of cool stuff, but uh, also kind of high end. Uh, FTP optional setting, that's for fire tra file transfer protocol. That's again, if your camera is connected to uh, a network basically by wire. So uh, not something we're gonna use uh, in most situations. Last up is USB power supply here in menu number one. And what that'll do is determine if, it's, if it senses its power, will it try and send data? Or if it's just data, will it try and send power? It's Again, settings that you'll want to play with a little bit, whether you're connected to like a USB power bank versus a USB coming off your computer. I just want power and I don't want to send any camera data to the computer. I just want to use it for power. So again, options here depending on your use case. Uh, last page here is all about uh, basically an option to reset at the bottom and the information about your specific camera on the top option here that says information. All right, lastly, the My Menu, a, a custom little area that you can save specific things you wanna come back to frequently. Uh, this is separate from the Q menu. They kind of complement each other. The Q stands for Quick Menu. Here might be some things that aren't in your Quick Menu, but you still wanna to get to quickly. This gets set up in the uh, Wrench menu, the, uh, the Setup menu under User Setting where you would tell that setting area what goes here. So this is the result of what you've set up in the wrench menu, which is the setup menu. I know it's confusing. Oh my goodness, so many different things going on here. Oh my goodness, that's a lot of stuff. Is your brain full? I'm starting to lose my voice a little bit. Ah, oh, it's a lot of talking. Uh, thanks for listening. I hope this has been helpful. Uh, I hope you're excited about getting to know your camera, about using this information to help you get the most out of your camera to make the photos you want to make. Uh, it's all about you and getting this computer device that we call cameras to do what you want. Uh, it does. It's not hard, but it's not easy either. There's a time commitment to learning this. Also, please be gracious to yourself. You're not going to remember it all. So there's this, again, the internet out there to help you with a quick search to find the thing you want. The, now that you know that you can do that thing to get the photo you want to make. Uh, if you have any questions on this stuff and want to ask, please do in the comments below. I'll also leave in the description below a link to my contact form email. Uh, if you have a longer question, that might be better answered that way. If you live in the Seattle area, 
uh, on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, come say hi to me at Kenmore Camera. Uh, love to have conversation with you. Uh, bring your camera if you want to do a, a quick chat about a setting or something. If you'd like to schedule a longer time, we do one-on-ones that uh, be glad to help you with that as well. So, ah, again, have fun with your camera. It's an amazing device. I hope you enjoy it. Go out there and have fun creating photos. So uh, we're not quite done with these videos yet. I've got part three, which will be uh, coming up in the week after this video comes out, uh, which will be about exposure modes. And then part four, which will be about drive modes, the Q menu, and the viewfinder display. So there's lots still to learn about your camera, but I hope you're having lots of fun and enjoying it and getting excited about making photos that you want. All right, I should stop talking. Okay, bye for now. See you in the next video. Take care. Be safe out there.